All right, good morning, guys. Maybe good afternoon, guys, whenever you woke up. Um, before we introduce ourselves, we're gonna go through a few questions and maybe you could ask um, and type in chat your answer or unmute yourself if you're comfortable. Uh, so for the first question, uh, just type in chat, yes or no, would you drink this water? Is this something that, you know, if you poured out a cup of water, you would be like, mmm, tasty. <laughs> No trick questions, just straight yes or no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, the water is pretty gross. Um, I personally don't like to drink water that looks like that. Um, to each their own, though. Uh, so um, on to the next question. What about this cup of water? How does this one look? Yes, exactly. So with water, we typically use our eyes as the thing that tells us whether we can drink it or not, but we're gonna learn that there's a lot more to it than just using your eyes. So what if we told you this water instead had come from the Hudson River? Would you still drink it? Not sure. Not sure. Sure. Yeah, so depending on how the water looks can oftentimes be us thinking, oh, it's for sure safe to drink, but when we find out where it's from, it might give us some hesitation. And that's with good reason. Um, sometimes there's things in water that we can't see. So we are the engineering ambassadors. This is our presentation on how can we clean our muddy water? My name is Bella Rocha, and I'm a dual major in mechanical engineering and a dual in design, innovation, and society. My name is Lehan. I'm a civil engineering major. My name is Andy, and I'm a mechanical engineering major. All right. So in this presentation, we are going to first go over what is harmful water, what is the type of water that's going to hurt us or be bad for us. Then we're going to go over flocculation and coagulation. And then we will finish off by talking about water filtration. So what we know is that there are many different things that can be found in water that we can't see. We call these things microorganisms. Um, this thing can be bacteria or viruses. You now they say wash your hands, hand sanitize. It's to kill the things on your hand that could be bad for you that you can't see with your eyes. Um, so when we have a few pictures for you, uh, the first one is um, this little guy, and he will cause severe stomach cramps um, or nausea and vomiting. So that's one of the main reasons why you might think we wash our hands or hand sanitize, Lysol, wipe down our desks at school. It's to kill the things that we can't see because this had to be seen with a microscope. This is called beaver fever. It can cause upset stomach and vomiting also very, very small. And this one can cause dehydration and weight loss. So they all look similar, right? And the black and <laughs> the black and white pictures of evil looking cells. Well, one thing that they all have in common is they all cause diarrhea and I would call them pretty nasty things that you would want that not want. So to get rid of these things, we want to make sure that none of this is in our water, right? We want to make sure none of these things that we can't see with our eyes are for sure not there and are not going to hurt us. Another thing that can be found in water is arsenic. Some of you may have heard of it, maybe in a TV show. Um, it's a pretty dangerous thing to find in your water. So we have a few pictures for you. Uh, it's kind of, it looks like this rock, which you would not think would be something that is very harmful to you, but in small quantities even, in any sort of water, it could actually be very deadly. Um, it can cause cancer, it can cause uh, poor immune systems, it can hurt your liver. So it's, it's a really scary thing to end up in your water, which is why we have to make sure as engineers, we're doing whatever we can to make sure that our water is very safe and clean to drink. So now that we talked about what 
can be so bad in water. Now let's talk about how engineers go about making water clean because everyone should have clean water. We call this process water treatment, going from water, let's say we took it from the Hudson River, and to make it something that we feel safe drinking. So the next step in this process is called flocculation and coagulation. Two very big words, but I promise you we're gonna explain them. So these two words are actually two different processes. They uh, that take going from water that is uh, that has all these particles floating around in it, like this harmful water here, right? That makes it all murky and stuff and making them all sink to the bottom so we can actually pick them up or scoop the clean water off uh, up from the top. So firstly, we have the process of coagulation. So this is putting a chemical in the water actually. And so this chemic, uh, so these particles, the reason why they stay in the water is because they are what we call suspended. So they uh, are just floating up in the water. They won't ever settle down. They're just gonna always kind of be in there. So, but when we put a coagulant for a coagulation, what that does is that they make these particles want to come together. It's like putting a magnet, right, in into the water. So they're going to pull all these particles together. However, right, just because you take a magnet and bring it into a room doesn't mean all the paper clips in the room are suddenly going to fly to your magnet, right? They need to be close enough to that magnet. That's why we have the process of flocculation, where we are stirring all that water together so the particles that want to attract to each other are close enough together so they actually group up. So we have that process together, but can actually happen because of flocculation. So and finally, once you have these large, large particles, what do you think will happen, right? It's like putting sand into water. They're going to sink all the way to the bottom. In this process, we call sedimentation. So now these particles are so big, they can't stay suspended in the water anymore. So they sink all the way to the bottom of the tank and we have clear water on top and then dirty water on the bottom. So this process can be a little confusing. So that's why we have a little demo here Unfortunately, um, because all the dirt outside is under <laughs> some ice and snow right now, I don't have any dirty water to demonstrate, but you can actually find a coagulant, which is called alum. So this is actually something I picked up at, a, at the local grocery store, right? And then, so I mixed a little bit of this into uh, some dirty water. So this is the dirty water before. You can even see some of the largest particles. They already started settling to the bottom just a little bit. But after just sitting around for a long time, we still have a lot of these particles still, again, suspended in the water. So we put the, uh, we put the alum in there, the coagulant, and then we we're mixing it together. And then after, I think about five minutes, it looked like this photo here on the, uh, this cup here on the right. So, wow. That's a pretty big difference, isn't it? Still, I personally wouldn't drink this, but it's certainly far, far clearer than it is here. And we can see a lot of that dirt has all sunk to the bottom. And then, so even after a longer period of time, think this is how clear the water got. Wow, that's really clear, isn't it? Right, we have some wood chips at the top here, but you can almost, um, but so much of, so much light can pass through the cup now. And then we have all this dirt and twigs and stuff at the bottom. So that's a lot, and all I did was add just a little bit of this as actually a spice um, that you can find at your grocery stores. So that's very cool. And so now the last step in the water uh, treatment process will be filtration. Um, so uh, in that last example that Langham showed us, you could tell that the water got a lot more clear, right? But there was still all the particles were in the water still. They were still in the cup just at the bottom of the cup. So we need to get all of those particles completely out of the water. And filtration is one of the best ways to do that. And um, so the way that filtration works is that what we have water molecules that are really small, and then we have the things that are dirty in the water, like bacteria that are very large. So let's think about the size of a bacteria as if it was the size of a football field. Um, you know, in the spirit of Super Bowl weekend, right? We got a football field and then think about um, a water molecule that's the size of a golf ball. So it would take over 3,000 golf balls to span the length of a football field. 
Um, and so that's the, the size difference between a water molecule and one bacteria. And then imagine that the filter was like the size of a basketball hoop, or you were trying to send a golf ball through a basketball hoop. That's pretty easy, right? A golf ball could easily fit through a basketball hoop. But if you were trying to take something the size of a football field, it would never be able to fit through a basketball hoop. It's just, it's impossible. And so that's how filtration works. It's, uh, we use things called membranes also, which have these little holes in them that will only allow for the water to pass through. And so membranes are often made up of different layers of materials. Um, and we often use a combination of very fine materials and then some more coarse materials. So fine materials would be the sand here. Uh, you can see the filter is mostly made up of sand because sand is packed together very closely and there are very small openings. So when you send water through it, most of the larger particles will not be able to fall through the sand. And then at the bottom, we have some more coarse sand. Um, this will catch any larger particles that did manage to get through. And then at the very bottom, we have some gravel that will catch, finally, hopefully, it'll catch every last uh, bacteria or dirt that gets through the water. And so in this animation, you see we have our water molecules, which are the little blue ovals, and then we have our bacteria and dirt, which are the red triangles. And um, eventually, throughout the filtration process, all of the bacteria were filtered out. And at the bottom, all we have left is our clean water, which is drinkable and that's what we want as engineers that's what we want to be able to provide to the large population and this is an example of a water bottle it's called the, the lifesaver water bottle that has a filter built into it and this is one of the most efficient ways to filter out the smallest particles in the dirtiest water and this is important because sometimes um in, especially in areas where there may not be enough um like there may not be a strong enough economy to build large water filtration plants then um, devices like this can be very helpful because it can be provided to individuals and they can they can take water from virtually anywhere um and filter it and it will be much more clean and drinkable um than it was before and so even though it may not be as clean as water from a filtration plant, it's a major improvement from just dirty water that you might find from a river or something like that. Um, and so this is a, a pretty, pretty big uh, accomplishment in engineering. And here we have a video that's uh, the creator of the water bottle is demonstrating and explaining his invention. I actually can't hear the audio for the video. I don't know if anybody else can. Uh, he's just saying, oh, I have some really filthy water here. Do you want to drink it? I'm going to place the top in there. <laughs> Give it a few pumps. And that is sterile drinking water. That was pretty impressive. Um, mm -hmm. So how does this process come together at a water treatment plant? So they're going to, we're going to go through all the steps we talked about in the process. So let's say we're going to draw from a reservoir. So big man-made lake that people um, dug up to, um, to store water, right? You have no idea what fell into that reservoir, so let's go through the water filtration process, uh, water treatment process. So step one is coagulation. So they're going to pull all that stuff into these tanks at the top, right? Where they're going to put in these coagulants, just like that alum that I showed you guys earlier. And then you see all this water is very turbulent, right? It's being all stirred up because they want all those all the magnets to get to all the particles. They want all of them to get stuck together. But eventually, after it gets stirred up a ton, it goes into these large tanks where it's allowed to rest. So all those larger particles can settle to the bottom in that process called sedimentation. 
After that, they go into filtration process, just like Andy talked about, where they go through these layers of filters so they can take out even more of those particles that might have uh, slipped through the coagulation and flocculation process. The very last step and the reason why we can't drink the water that we filter out is disinfection. So if we remember those really harmful um, bacteria and viruses that Bella talked about, um, those can sometimes be so, so tiny that even through all these processes, they can actually still be in the water. And that's why we go through a disinfection process. We make sure we actually kill all of those particles to make sure that it is safe to drink, safe to be stored, and safe to be brought to your house. So thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation. Um, we will take any questions and then we'll move on to the next portion of our activity. Stop sharing. Feel, feel free to unmute yourself or type any questions in the chat. Okay, so if there are no questions, we're going to, oh. I live in Dallas. In addition to the mechanical treatment, they use a natural process. How does that work? Well, um, I can probably speak a little bit on that. In one of my classes, I actually created like a natural water filtration system. So um, typically with natural processes, it just means natural materials. So there's a lot of things that we can get out in the world uh, to filter our water. So it's not just like rocks and sand, but depending on the region you're in, you can utilize a lot of different plants or like seashells, um, anything like that. And typically they just add more and more layers and each of those things will serve as a different purpose to pull something else out of the water. Um, so sometimes it's charcoal, sometimes um, it's not these like chemically induced um, treatments, uh, especially when you think about like when you have a mountain and, it, and the water's running down it, typically by the bottom of the mountain, the water's uh, basically drinkable because it's run through so many natural resources that have been able to clean and filter the water because oftentimes the contaminants that we're so afraid of in the water were actually created by us. Um, a lot of the times we're worried about things that were like oil spills or different chemicals accidentally getting in the water. Um, so when we go and drink water from areas where it's only natural, uh, you often don't have to worry about things like that. You can use only the natural resources to get what is basically drinkable water. And if you're ever worried, oh, well, if you're ever curious also about how clean water is just out in your environment, uh, I know at these for state parks, they actually test their water every single day. So if you're ever going swimming and you're like, oh, I'm concerned about what might be in this water here, you can actually find that on the internet if it's part of a state park. So know your resources. Okay, fantastic question. So I guess we'll move on to our next portion. And if you have the materials, it's going to be uh, making your own filter. So I'm actually going to share my screen again here. And if you it's don't after... have the materials, we ask that maybe just uh, have each of your um, students uh, get a piece of paper and something to write with. So think in your so just kind of think about uh, what might go into your filter. So right, so this is the activity designing your own gravity filter because that's um. That's the big thing that we're talking about here, gravity filters. Of course, we can't build our own little water treatment plant, but we can simulate one part of the process, which is this filtration portion. So let's just take some household items you might have in your house, sand from your sandbox, some pebbles that you might find outside, um, maybe even cleaned off a little bit, uh, napkins, paper towels, coffee filters, cotton balls. Hilariously, I actually don't have that many things in my house, um, nor do I even have the dirty water, but I do have a coffee filter and I have a cup. And I have oatmeal because I made oatmeal and I want to eat it after this. So, um, so you guys will also get to watch me filter my oatmeal. And then you can do some predictions. What is the filter going to catch? What is the filter not going to catch? Yeah. And for those of you that don't have the materials, uh, maybe think about the materials we have here. And we'll ask you to have your students maybe design their own on paper and um, just write, oh, I would put maybe a coffee filter 
then some pebbles, then another coffee filter and start thinking through what their process is and what they might put um, in their filter, how much of everything is they're gonna put. Cause you know, if you just have, you know, 30 coffee filters in a row, it's gonna filter your coffee, uh, your water very well, but your water also might not be able to run through it because it's so thick that you might not actually be able to get anything at the end of it. So have your students just um, design their own with any sort of materials they can think of and start drawing it out on a piece of paper. So, of course, then the question is, just we can tell from our eyes, right? We can have kind of a sense, oh, this water looks cleaner than this one, but can we get that as a number? So, what people, what scientists and engineers do out in the real world is they measure something called turbidity. So, that's going to be how much light can pass through the sample. So, if you remember from all the way back here, right, when we had when I had this really dirty water, this would have a very high turbidity, right? Very little light can pass through. But after we, after everything had a chance to settle, right? We had see a lot of light coming through the cup. Go back all the way to the end. <laughs> uh, and then, so we can actually measure that um, using, using a measurement called NTU. Turbidity units, that's all that matters. So we see zero NTUs, no light can pass through, but all the way up to 400 NTUs where a lot of light can pass through. So this is if the activity was in a team format. So keep this slide up. Um, so if there are any, so you don't have to worry about the money, but if you want to challenge yourself to only spend $500 with the prices that we have there, uh, I challenge you to do so. Do we have any questions? Okay, then the time is 104. So if you guys are thinking, um, I don't know if anyone legitimately does want to see me filter some oatmeal into a cup, but I will do it. Literally, you can raise your hand. I will do this. This is the only way I made oatmeal, but I also want to eat the oatmeal. Okay, we're. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is. I think we all want to see that. <laughs> Wait, I can just clean this. A very whack setup right now. Okay, this is the plan. So if you also were going to make your own filter at home, right? The idea would that you'd have actually two cups, right? So let's say I also had this cup. So I would have my filter built in this cup, right? So I could push this all the way to the bottom, assuming that there of course were holes in the bottom of this cup. So when you like kind of put it over here, you pour in your dirty water and then it would kind of go through the filtration process and then you would have a separate cup that would have your cleaner water. But in this case, I don't have any cups with holes in them, nor am I going to make that. So the plan is I'm going to do everything and then just this one cup. Do I have a... Okay, I'm just going to use one filter because, again, if you use multiple filters, right, those little holes that we're having um, the little particles be filtered through, if they line up right, right, they're going to block even the water, water particles because they're just, the holes are just so tiny. So if they overlap in a certain way, uh, they're just going to block everything. Okay. Should I scoop the oatmeal? I think we're going to scoop the oatmeal. I think that's the play. It's been sitting here for a long time, though. So I don't even think there's much to go in. I also made it with milk, too. I don't even think anything will fall through. Wait, you guys can't even see that. Actually, this actually might be better. How much oatmeal can I get into this? I, I should go make more oatmeal. I will get the milk jug. That's nothing. <laughs> so if I poured milk into this, what do you think is going to come out into the bottom? Is it going to be like clear, like water? Do we think it's going to just be straight up milk? What do we also, think? It could not be falling through if you don't have any airflow. So if you want, you could also lift the filter up a little bit from the sides. That might allow some to fall. I feel like I'm doing tea right now. Oh, I see a hand raise. You can comment in the chat. You can unmute yourself.
it's just me with my oatmeal. <laughs> I want to get these get something out of the bottom. But this is a real question though. If I pour milk into this, what do you think is gonna come out the other side? Is it gonna be milk? Is it gonna be milk but like less milk? <laughs> e <laughs> What do you think? Also, if you guys do have the materials together and are making your own filters, please let me know. Okay, so we have one person that says it's going to be milk. I would actually, I would agree with you. Because we have to think about how tiny these milk particles are, right? So, um, there is water in there, but the particles that make it milk, the soluble fats and stuff are like really, really small too. So they probably would not be filtered out. It's like orange juice. We also have to think about how much of milk is water, right? So in our fridge, we might have, aside from, you know, soy milk and oat milk, we usually have maybe 0% or we have skim milk, 1%, 2% and whole milk. So when it says it's 2% milk, that means that it's 98% water. That's a lot of water. I thought, I I thought mean, that's a fat percentage. Yeah, it's 2% fat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so when you have 98% water and then 2% fat, which is milk fat. Um, so you're, the thing you have in your hand is a majority of it is water. Um, so when you run it through the filter to get out that other 2%, it's going to take probably a bit more than just a coffee filter. But don't get me wrong for things that I'm not sure if any of you have ever seen, uh, milk that is like fresh. Sometimes it creates a little thing on top, like a curd, right? When you get fresh milk cows, it, it kind of has like a layer on top. If you poured that through a filter, you would be able to get that on top. And that would filter out some of the fat in your milk. Now I'm trying to think of all the different milks I might have in my house. <laughs> so we do use other filters. So if you think your water is suspicious, please do test it. Make sure it's okay. <laughs> yeah, um, this is not to say that you can get any water and just put it through a coffee filter and drink it. <laughs> This is, it gets it one step closer to being drinkable, but not necessarily mm -hmm. entirely drinkable. And like we said, there's a, tons of resources that you can all use to make water clean. I've heard of people using uh, the bamboo fibers, um, different types of leaves are really helpful. Uh, it's really cool the types of stuff that you can do with different types of natural resources and how they all act differently. Yeah, and even, I don't know if, um, if any of you have been camping before, but sometimes um like even just taking some water from a natural resource like a river or something and then like boiling it um that can make it a lot cleaner um that because as we talked about in the presentation there are a lot of little microorganisms but boiling water can often kill those microorganisms and um, that can eliminate a lot of the risk so that's part of the disinfection process, um, that very last step. Usually in water treatment plants, they're not going to be boiling it because that's a lot and lot of energy to boil that much water just to have it cool and then go elsewhere. Uh, so usually they will use uh, typically chemical processes. Um, UV and disinfection is becoming more popular these days just to kill all those microbes in the water. Uh, it's also important to think about who has this problem, right? So uh, in most places in the United States, the actual water that we get from our, even our shower is basically drinkable. Uh, the water we get from our sink is basically drinkable without filtering it. Many of us still filter it afterwards just to be safe, but uh, a lot of the times it's perfectly safe to drink that way, but there's a lot of places where that's not the case, right? Um, I know Flint, Michigan is a place that is still struggling to get clean water. Some of you may have heard of them, um, and they have struggled to have access to clean water. A lot of other countries where they don't have the infrastructure that we have here, they struggle to get clean water. So we have to think about how can we make designs that help them? Um, how can we create new orders of filters? How can we create new systems that will allow for everyone to have drinking water? Because we all need water to live. And so it's one of those things that is a huge issue today. So uh, actually, at least in all of America, the EPA or the um... Department of Environmental Protection, the Environmental Protection Agency or something like that, or um, mm -hmm. they have standards on drinking water that comes from the tap that's like provided to you from your town, city, or whatnot. And those regulations, you can find them online. They essentially say the water has to be clean enough to drink and not get sick from, but they're actually, um, 
those standards actually don't go there are two standards there's a minimum standard and then there's a standard that most people would consider like drinkable water right where it uh go, that does the stuff like taste the color of the water whether or not it will stain your teeth sort of stuff um so officially tap water from the united states is safe to drink but if it does taste funky that's not um it's not always an indicator that it is unsafe they're not is, um, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, what happened in Flint, Michigan was that they actually didn't even make that minimum standard. Uh, that In that problem, the issue was actually lead. So there was lead in the pipes that um, got into the water and stuff. The water infrastructure there was just very, um, very poor. Um, and lead is actually kind of similar to arsenic. It actually does dissolve in water and that stuff actually cannot be boiled out because it is just a element. So that's, um, so lead would actually need to have to be filtered out. So it's also clear too when it's dissolved in water. Uh, I believe in Troy. They sent us a letter saying that some of the pipes to the houses may be lead pipes, so we should test them. Uh, so the problem is not really exclusive to any one place. It's typically very old infrastructure when lead used to be the next big thing in pipes, and then pe they found out it was harming people. We had to read a book on this for school. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about their filter? If, they're, if you guys are doing it on paper or actually building it or anything that you are learned? I don't think this actually... There's a little milk coming out from the bottom, but I think I'm just gonna dump it back into my bowl and I'll eat it afterwards, this oatmeal. They always say don't play with your food. Huh? They always say not to play with your food. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't wanna I didn't wanna waste. I don't wanna be wasteful, right? So I was like, if I'm gonna do this activity, might as well do something that I can like eat afterwards. Like I could have I could have made some nasty mix of like hot chocolate coffee grounds, blah 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 blah, and then try filtering that. But that seems wasteful. So I just wanted to eat it afterwards. So here we are. <laughs> I'll put that onto the side. If no one has any questions specifically about the filter, we can also open it up to questions about anything. I know that this presentation can be a bit difficult to understand because there's a very large range of ages um, that we have here today. So it, sometimes it can be a bit more difficult uh, to understand some of the bigger concepts. Um, so if you have any questions about anything in the presentation, feel free to ask. And for that matter, you can also ask any questions to us. You have three college kids here, um, all <laughs> engineering majors, uh, all wanting to help. So if you have any questions about college, any questions about curriculum, any questions about what classes do you take? What kind of stuff do you do here? Whatever it may be. Uh, fortunately, we have three people who are different majors, I can remind you. so. Um, I am a mechanical engineer with a dual in design, innovation, and society. Um, Andy is a major in mechanical engineering, and Lehan is a major in civil engineering. So any questions in those fields, send them our way. Any questions about college, send them our way. I hope you guys have some fun things planned for earlier. I mean, for later today. I know that a lot of other groups are having some really fun activities planned for you guys as well. By the way, if you ever think, oh, you're welcome. Um, yes, environmental engineers, uh, or you, civil engineers that concentrate on environmental engineering, they take many classes here on water resources. And uh, I think actually water resources is now concentration. So you can be a civil engineer with a concentration in water resources. I'm a civil engineer, but in my concentration is actually transportation engineering. Um, so people can concentrate in a lot of different areas, structural engineering, geotechnical engineering, but they actually just recently started the water resources one, because that's just how important it is um, for everyone to have access to clean water, clean, affordable water. Uh, 
uh, I like to think of engineers just as inventors. Um, when I was a kid, I was like, oh, I want to be an inventor when I grow up. I didn't totally know what the word was, uh, but I later learned that it, it, it is engineer. So typically, if you want to invent things and you want to use science or technology to do that, uh, you go into engineering. And then I am also a dual in design, which is, I guess, the other type of inventing. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure if any of you have any idea what you want to be when you grow up, but maybe you could comment in the chat if you have any idea what you want to be when you grow up or what you want to go to school for. What does being a design major entail? I know that that's not a super common major that people can think of on, off of the top of their head. Uh, yeah, so it's different depending on where you go. At RPI, uh, there it's in the social science department. So we learn a lot about like the people that we're designing for and making sure that like um, whatever we're creating isn't hurting anything. But it, the difference between engineering is it's less math and science based and more prototyping based. So we learn a lot of like woodworking. We learn a different type of 3D modeling software. We learn rhinoceros. Um, we learn a lot of different types of stuff like that. But I've designed a lot of different things in mind. So I like to design toys, uh, curriculum, like education stuff. No clue what to be. Leia would like to be a ballerina teacher and firewoman. Ooh. Ooh that's, that's a, a powerful threat. trio right there. <laughs> Ballerina teacher and a firewoman. Well, would you be a, a teacher in like a ballerina teacher or a fire person a teacher, or would you just teach like something else, like English or math? I kind of want to be a teacher. I have a lot of like career paths like in mind. I was like, I kind of want to be, I want to be a professor, but I also don't really want to do the research part of it. So I was thinking, what if I become a lecturer? But they don't get paid anything, so it's really sad. <laughs> uh, so I guess the plan is to work in industry and then come back to be a professor of practice or something, like some of my professors right now. Or either that or work for the state. It's a pseudo-retirement plan. It's all about the pseudo-retirement plan. <laughs> but if you have no clue what you want to be, that's completely fine. Even um, uh, kindergarten. Very cool. Um, even even people our age, right? They're still trying to figure out what they want to do. I ask myself every day. It's like, is this what I want to be doing? Is this what I uh, kind of want to set out and do for the rest of my life? But you have a very long time ahead of you. So just do what, do what you enjoy doing, you know? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, actually, yeah, like I was going to comment on the no clue what you want to be also because I recently changed my major and after three years of school, I changed my major from nuclear engineering to mechanical engineering. So like, it's never too late to figure out what interests you the most. And um, I also wanted to be a firefighter when I was in kindergarten. So that's very relatable. Leo. And, yeah. So there's, you know, you, you listed three different careers. That's awesome. It's, it is possible to, to do all of those things, like even though the structure of like education and careers isn't always like designed for three different to, to send you out into three different careers, it is possible. So, you know, if that's your dream, then go for it and, you know, just figure out what you really want to do as you get older. <laughs> to be a chef and then senior year I was like I want to be a math major senior year of high school I was like I want to be a math major and I was like actually architecture and then I was like actually still engineering and then I was like actually environmental so then I came into RPI as environmental and then I was like actually mechanical and then I added design and even now we're not sure we're not sure what we're doing. yeah I always used to say I wanted to be an engineer when I was younger and then during high school, I got really into music, and I was like, I'm going to be a musician. And then I was like, oh, I'll still go to school for engineering. So now, you know, I still love music, you know, so it's, you can have more than one passion, and it's good to have more than one passion. I like to sew, <laughs> do art things, so. I have all this crocheting stuff up here because of a, like a, a volunteering activity where we were, with one of the clubs I'm part of, and I still never made my blanket. We were supposed to crochet blankets for cats. 
at a cat shelter, and I never did it. But I really want to do it. I have the, I have Thank everything you. right here. And like my roommate right now, um, she's only taking a few classes at Hudson Valley because she's been doing like so many classes um, at RPR Street. And then she, she just sits around and she crochets sometimes in the apartment. I'm so envious of her. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, I spent like four hours making a cake. Cooking is a full event. Like, I, I don't know if I don't know how people can just I'm, I can't I'm not ready to just like feed myself, I think, because like it's like a full event. You know, it's a full it's a ritual, right? You start off by cleaning the entire kitchen, then you cook. For me, it's like a three hour minimum uh, cooking event. Like, it'd be like, the recipe says this will be done in 30 minutes. I was like, I'll see you in three hours. Yeah, and I never trust that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the entire ritual of, like, cleaning up afterwards and... <sighs> I should cook today. That's the plan. Anyways, everyone should cook today. Everyone should also be an engineer. Or a little <laughs> <laughs> everyone no, should we need, we need, um, pretty... Any, any, um, there's a role for everyone, I think. Um, even in fields that you don't think particularly need, you know, engineering firms, believe it or not, are not 100% engineers. <laughs> even in the uh, medium sized I guess, firm I worked for over the summer, they had a little cluster of lawyers. They need lawyers at the engineering firm. So, there is a place for everyone. And then you can even try multiple places. You can ask, what's your favorite... Uh, subject in school. What do you like most? Do you like reading? Do you like math? Right. Just a comment. Leave your favorite one. Mm -hmm. I narrowed down my options. I was like, look at, think of all the careers out there. I like to say when people have absolutely no idea what they want to do, right? You can always like cross out the pretty obvious things that you don't want to do. Um, my state college, UConn, they have a their top one of their big majors. Well, not big majors. One, um, one of a high ranking major of theirs is puppeteering. Yes, I don't want to be a puppeteer, so that was an easy one to cross off. Uh, I can't, I can't read a lot of boring things for a really long times. So there goes being a lawyer. <laughs> Zoe and so, Jade said they like math and reading. Very fun. Oh, I didn't scroll down. I didn't see all of these. Math yes. and reading are both very important in engineering. We use those all the time. <laughs> I read a lot of manuals. So many yeah. manuals, all the manuals. These days, I do a lot of math, but I don't. I don't do that much English. Yes, as I like to say, transportation engineering. It starts off engineering over here, and then it goes into data, like a lot of data for a very long time. If, I, if this is the scale of depth, and this is, if you as you move this way, it goes engineering, then data for a long time, and then politics. I was going to ask, do you have to learn about like policies and all that? It depends on what you're doing. Uh, it depends on where you are in the scale. A lot of small, the reason why civil engineers can have really, really small firms is because they, um, is because they can pick up subcontracting work, right? Two got the, you, you can have two people that hang out in a basement and then they can, that's a civil engineering firm right there. They just have to fill out some paperwork and they can pick up subcontracted work uh, when someone, let's say, wants to put an extension on their house, right? That's not terribly uncommon. They still need those plans to be drawn up and then signed by a professional engineer. That's a license that you can get. Uh, I'll be taking my PE after five years of design work. So that's in my future. Um, so, and then you can just sign off so, and then they just like work from their basement doing really small projects like that. And at the slightly larger scale, let's say a town wants to put in a new bridge or yeah, a new bridge, or even just wants to like add sidewalks, there's a full engineering process in that needs to go into that design. So, and then it can get a little bigger in terms of things like bridges, larger buildings and stuff. We also get a mix of architectural firms in there. Um, and then when you start getting to things like city planning, how are we going to be managing traffic at a large scale? How, where should, how should this land be used properly so people are happier and not sadder? Then it becomes data. How is this going to affect traffic? How is this going to affect things into the future? How can we turn humans that are very unpredictable into something that we can sort of predict? 
I take a, I've taken a class here where essentially you're given all this information about all these families and then you're like, how many trips are they going to produce? And then you compare them to how many trips they actually produce because they've recorded all this data. And every single one of our models were wildly inaccurate <laughs> because that's just how unpredictable people are. But there was like mild correlation, just a little bit. Anyway, and that's why it becomes politics at the far end of the scale. Um, most of our professors right now are between data and politics, some a little more in data, some a little more in politics. So it's quite a place to be. I think I might see myself doing that in the future, but just from like what the beginning of the any even major says doesn't always encompass exactly what it actually ends up being. I know a lot of people that go into environmental engineering thinking certain thing thinking, not I don't know exactly what they think it is, but I do know most people don't imagine that it's as much water resources as it ends up being, because it's all about the water. It really is. That's my spiel about water resources. It's a, it's a very stable work environment, though. Believe it or not, everyone does need water. <laughs> Story. Engineers use a lot of data. <laughs> <laughs> so much data. I have data homework to do later today for next week. Sounds fun. <laughs> uh, any questions? I uh, could drop them in chat. If not, we'll probably end the session. Thank you for joining us. Um, from it. <laughs> and if you do have the time or the interest, you know, go ahead um, on your own time. Try to gather some resources. Maybe like you know. Like we suggested coffee filters, cups, um, maybe some sand or pebbles. And uh, yeah, just if you want to try to try to build your own little filter and um, yeah, best of luck. And it was great to, to be with you guys today. Thank you. Thank you.